Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, especially our patrons. Remember, you can get an ad-free version of this show and more at patreon.com slash DTNS. Coming up on the show, action cams heat up, cameras start sporting SSDs, and will we soon see a new 35mm point-and-shoot? This is the Photography News for the month of September 2022 in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Straffolino. And from north of the wall, I'm Anthony Lemos. You know, during the month, photography news sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. So once a month, we shine the spotlight on it. We crank it up. Uh, we we stop it down. We get everything in focus. We have a lot of depth of field into the news. <laughs> so let's start with a bit of photo news you might have missed. Viltrox is a Chinese lens maker that that's made a name for itself, providing affordable autofocus lenses with good performance. It's also pretty good at reverse engineering lens mounts, providing autofocus lenses for Fuji's X mount years before it opened up to third parties. Over the past few months, people noticed their recent lenses for Canon's RF mount were no longer available from retailers. In an age of constant supply chain constraints, it wasn't clear why they weren't available. And now we have a statement from Canon Germany. It said, Canon believes that these products infringe their patent and design rights and has therefore requested the company to stop all activities that infringe Canon's intellectual property rights. Uh, in other words, they just, they went, they went all for themselves. Either there was, there was a lawsuit on the table or Viltrax didn't want to do a lawsuit, but yeah. The old legal action uh, taking away your... It doesn't sp seem great for third-party RF lenses at this point. Right. All right. Next up, Topaz Labs offers some well-regarded AI enhancement photo editing tools, things like Denoise AI, Sharpen AI, and Gigapixel AI. Gigapixel particularly always impresses me. Now the company will integrate these three apps under a new Topaz Photo AI app. This will include a new autopilot feature, which will automatically suggest adjustments across all three modules. Topaz Photo AI will also include plugins for Adobe Lightroom Classic, Adobe Photoshop, and Capture One. It's available now for $199. It's actually, it's actually pretty compelling. Fuji Can't announced see. the X-H2 mirrorless camera. It uses the same body as the already released X-H2S, but swaps the camera's stacked 26-megapixel sensor with a 40-megapixel X-Trans sensor. It can shoot video at up to 8K at 30 frames per second, offers a 160-megapixel pixel shift mode. <sighs> It's available now for two thousand dollars, and Pixel Shift always just <laughs> grates me. The name or the tech? The name. Okay. The name. You're on. You're on board with like high resolution photo stacking. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it was a big month for APS-C camera releases. Sony announced the FX30 cinema camera. They actually did it like yesterday, so that's kind of cool. It's almost identical to the existing FX3, but uses a 26 megapixel APS-C sensor versus full frame on the FX3. It can shoot oversampled 4K at up to 60 frames per second and cropped 120p video, records internally at 10-bit 422 video, and includes IBIS as well as an active cooling fan. It ships in October for $1,799. Pretty interesting price point. Anytime video has active cooling, I just think... Where's the mat? Where's the microphone? <laughs> Only 10 Zeiss Planner 50 millimeter F point zero or point zero point seven lenses were ever produced. That's a 50 millimeter F point seven. Six of them were made for NASA. Three of the remaining units were acquired by Stanley Kubrick and modified to be used as cinema lenses for the film Barry Lyndon, used in a scene lit by only two candles. Wide open, it lets in two stops more light than the F1.4 lens. Now the lens has returned to Zeiss to go on display at its Museum of Optics, lent by the firm's executive producer, Jan Harlan. Oh, Jan, giving up. Uh, was, was he shooting with it? Like he was just sitting there with it on a shelf, right? I mean, I guess you wouldn't do anything with it because uh, you'd be terrified of breaking it. But <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where you're always wondering what executive producers actually do. And now you know, they steal lenses from set. 
Hey, to be like the, the article is definitely worth a read because it goes into like how like he had to like call up Zeiss and convince them to make this with working with like a film gate and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it was super interesting mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and and amazing optic. And keep in mind, uh, ten minus six minus three is still one. So where's the other one at? Uh, I I think NASA's not telling us something. That seems to be the likely call. Yeah, probably give it to the aliens. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they need to see. It's uh, that's what's on the James Webb uh, telescope. Actually, they just sent it up there. All right. Uh, well, uh, it's been a big month for action cams. DJM announced the Osmo Action Three. This ditches the module design of its predecessor, the Osmo Action Two. It could shoot up to 4K 120 frame per second video with its Rocksteady 3.0 stabilization on. It natively supports vertical video because that's what the kids like, and is waterproof up to 52 feet. I think the uh, original one was about 30 three feet or somewhere around there. It's available for pre-order now for $329, but not to be outdone. Amos, I don't know why I went to your read, so why don't you take over? Do you well, want me to redo that? Well, Rich, <laughs> GoPro announced the Hero 11 Black and 11 Black Mini cameras. They can record up to 5.3K video in an open gate 8 to 7 aspect ratio. This enables a mode where it can maintain level video regardless of how the camera is rotated a la what the kids want. The Mini lacks the front and rear screens and has a non-removable battery. The Hero 11 Black is available now for $500 with GoPro subscribers getting it for $400. And the Mini retails for $400, available for subscribers for $300. Shipping October 25th, just in time for Halloween. It's for all of your Halloween uh, vlogs and uh, your snowboarding, Halloween snowboarding, all of your your action cam needs there. So Um, so you can put it in your trick-or-treat bag is what it is. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You can do your time lapse of all your trick-or-treating. Exactly, exactly. That sick street set. So I have have thoughts on these action cameras and just action cameras in general, the, the, the Osmo action, the GoPros. These are kind of very specific use cases and... I want to know where you sit on how well they're used because sometimes I am really impressed with the, 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 the footage that people can get with these things. And other times I'm like, you just strapped a camera to your helmet and didn't do anything to actually show me what anything that I want. So where where do you sit on it? I'm a fan of, you know, when it, when it comes to increasingly either large sensor cameras or sophisticated computational stuff, like, the fact that you just have like a a really solid platform that's like really purpose focused of we're going to provide like the the basics are like we're going to provide amazing stabilization it's going to be like everything proof and you know it, it's just kind of a, an all in one where you don't have to worry like if it falls apart i mean like i don't want to lose 329 dollars but i'd rather lose that than like a thousand dollars if my iphone broke or something like that or if my, my mirrorless camera broke you know i'd be out a similar amount of money um i i'm a big fan of i do agree like there, there's almost become a, a parody of what action cam footage will look like, especially you know the uh, you know the the more adventurous kind of stuff. But the fact that it is a a pocketable like everything proof camera is really tempting, and I've actually kind of come to appreciate it. I have a original Osmo Action, the one I guess retroactively now, and like the stabilization on that. If until I've tried it, the stabilization on those is remarkable. I'm, I'm assuming both of these have significantly better even then, but you know, it's doing that thing where it has like the, it's like a 14 millimeter lens or equivalent, and then it crops in a little bit and does kind of active stabilization. And it really is like you're floating on a cloud. Uh, when that thing is on, I was doing some stuff where I clipped it on the back of like a little car that my kids were, you know, I was pushing my kids on and like running as fast as I could in my backyard. And it's just like, you know, it's on a gimbal. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I'm, I like the fact that DJI is basically going like, we're not going to mess with the formula that GoPro has put out there. We tried this modular thing. Didn't seem like people liked it. Um, so we're going back to this, this more classic design. GoPro, I want to be more enthusiastic. The whole subscription thing though, it, it, it kind of rubs me the wrong way how aggressively they're, they're pushing it, which costs 50 bucks a year, gives you access to like cloud uploads and, and storage mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so there is some utility, but I just don't like, you know, my, my pricing being subscription driven for any kind of camera, I guess, you know, cell phones, we've been living with that for a while. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything that subsidizes the camera, you know, exactly. Yeah. Um, I will say that as skeptical as I am about how people use these, I am also the drone operator that never gets 
anything good is just flying around taking <laughs> pictures of stuff for goofy you know reasons. So I understand the, the 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 fun in it, not just the utility. But I really do like that DJI and GoPro are both putting out these cameras that aren't trying to be cinema cameras. They are purpose built and and they stay in their lane. I wish GoPro wasn't so iterative. <laughs> you know, I I do think what they're doing with the image sensor is really interesting and in being like basically we're going to give you a square sensor and like it it kind of plays up its uh its bona fides right it's yeah. not to your point it's not saying like it'll shoot 10 bit like okay great you can grade your gopro footage congratulations <laughs> but like you know like the fact that they're like we're not soaking up every little bit of resolution it's not so much about that it's about we can get you a really cool 4k crop that will intelligently you know use some gyroscope stuff and and level that out so when you have it on your your snowboard helmet or whatever It'll look kind of, uh, I, mean, I guess cinematic might be the right word, but it'll look, you can get a very particular look with that that's going to be very hard to do in post with any right. other system, which I think is cool. Yeah, and they, and they have their own their own special post-processing software to it and everything else that helps you achieve all that as well. Um, and yeah, I I really, I, I want to see them do more. I, what I really want to see is the display at Target when I walk in and see the, the GoPro display to be able to look at the three models they show and be able to differentiate between the three of them and, and what their <laughs> yeah. features are. So anyway, it's September, and that means we've got new iPhones out this year. There's an even bigger difference between the standard iPhone 14 and the iPhone 14 Pro models. Historically, the Pro models have gotten upgraded cameras and codecs and better displays, but this year it also gets a new system on a chip, new SOC. We're talking about photography news, so let's focus on the cameras. The 14 Pros come with a new 48 megapixel main sensor that's 65% larger than the 12 megapixel sensor on the iPhone 13 Pro. In casual shooting, you won't notice this with Apple using what it calls quad pixel to pixel bin the images down to 12 megapixels. The full 48 megapixels are available when shooting in Pro Raw. In terms of focal lengths, the main camera is an f1.78 24 millimeter equivalent. The ultra wide is an f2.2. 13 millimeter equivalent and the telephoto gets all the way out there to 77 millimeter equivalent at f2.8 for video users you can shoot in cinematic mode at 4k at either 24 or 30 frames per second there's also a new action mode that shoots at 2.8k at 60 frames per second the cropped resolution is due to extra digital stabilization actually looks really nice from what i can tell Models with 256 gigabytes of storage can also shoot in Pro, ProRes 4K at 30 frames per second, although base storage models are limited to 1080p. I actually had to check on that because I thought that was a typo. They don't come cheap. The 14 Pro starts at $999 and the 14 Pro Max at $1099, very similar to last year's models, although if you're in, in uh, Europe, it's been increased a little bit. Yeah, so we're uh, in, in the UK against the diminishing pound, right? <laughs> Especially that, yeah. Um, what uh, what do you what do you think about this uh, this quad pixel pixel binning stabilization? Like, do, what do you think about this approach to a larger sensor but using less of it at a time for most purposes? I think the Nokia PureView has won the long game when it came to smartphone camera technology because they had this way back in like what 2012 the seven oh <laughs> eight oh eight PureView eight oh eight yeah. that was a phone I always wanted. Um, yeah, I, this makes total sense because most users are going to be posting this to Instagram. You don't need the resolution. What you need is something that has a really smart uh, DSP and a lot of processing power that can say, "All right, we're going to take out the noisy pixels. We're going to take out the you know." Uh, we're we're gonna you know evaluate what are the best pixels and produce, uh you know provide more information for this computational photography that's you know just increasingly the standard across all cell phone platforms particularly iOS it seems like, yeah. um what's what's interesting to me is the continued like hey we're really pushing like. I think a lot of people when the pro iPhones came out they you kind of rolled their eyes it's like okay what's really pro about them. The Pro Raw stuff, I fooled around. I have a, a 12 uh, Pro Max, and the Raw stuff is nice. Um, you don't get, you can't really push shadows all that much, and, and that kind of stuff. But it's it's certainly more than you can in a JPEG. But when it comes to continuing that, you know, being able to shoot 
ProRes video, that's pretty impressive. I mean, that that does give you more latitude than you can even get on a lot of uh, mirrorless cameras, at least up until a couple of years ago when they've really started pushing, you know, more 10-bit stuff and that kind of stuff. Obviously, given the size of the resolu- uh, the, the sensor, you're still, uh, you know, it, it's it still has its limitations. But like, if you're going to call it a pro, that's kind of a pro feature. Like yep. that is like a, a production feature um, that you're going to be able to use. And I'm assuming the 1080p thing was because you would get at 128, you probably get like 10 minutes of recording <laughs> before your, <laughs> your thing. I, that, yeah. that, I, I have some thoughts that we might see something in another story on here. The one thing that interesting though, the sensor is now to a size. Now, obviously we've seen Sony ship with one inch sensors in phones uh, as of late. Mm-hmm. Um, but the crop factors on these are actually not as astronomical as they, they once were for these tiny little things, because I think it's a, on the main sensor, it's a 3.5 crop. Considering that micro four thirds is a two X crop when you're talking about, uh, you know, lens equivalencies and that kind of stuff. It's not like completely out of the ballpark of what we're already kind of used to dealing with. And I imagine that's why they keep the uh, the telephoto at F2.8. Uh, one, obviously, they need to keep the size of the lens down. But I think focusing actually becomes an issue. It's one thing to focus a, an actual six millimeter lens. That's what the main camera uses. Like six millimeter lens, everything is in focus out of once you get out of a foot. So you mm-hmm. really don't need a particularly great autofocus system with that. When you get to 77, so we're talking about what, uh, I don't know, in the teens, uh, like high teens, when it comes to what that uh, crop's going to be, or 20, 20 millimeter, that's like a little bit more considerable yeah. when you're thinking about what you actually need to focus. So I imagine stopping it down makes it a little easier. Yeah. And something else is, uh, of course, all these numbers, the 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 f stop equivalent and the the focal length equivalent all these are mathematical numbers they're not physical yes. numbers the physical numbers are way different and the math yeah. is <laughs> is kind of insane but they 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 make it to where they, like they do the math in a way that makes it relatable cuz nobody mm-hmm. wants a no nobody wants a 1.6 <laughs> millimeter equivalent yeah. lens at <laughs> at f 33 or whatever the math comes out to um but I do like the fact that and, – and Apple isn't I, – I, I love their marketing, but I always distrust it just a little bit because I know they're going to skew it in the best way possible because they have an entire division of people that just make everything positive. The pixel binning, it's not actually pixel binning. It's pixel combining, which – I think the reviews that I've seen are all looking pretty good. We're getting into the winter time though. And that's usually when you start seeing the iPhone reviews, the three months later reviews, and they find the problems with the shadows and the dark areas and things like that in iPhones. It's just been my experience. That's usually when it comes out is right before Christmas time. So I'm interested to see how those three month reviews end up for the iPhone 14 pro and pro max. But yeah, I, 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 I do think that I, I I do think their approach to how they're they're what what they're doing with quad pixel, based on my understanding of it, I am not a uh, uh, I am not a light scientist. <laughs> I just <laughs> I just use cameras. The way that 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 is set up, I do think that should make at least for a less noisy image. Now, whether it's going to go too soft. As a result of that, I think comes down to their computational stuff, which they've again. If this was first gen, if this was like the first time they're you know touting their computational photography bona fides, uh, you know maybe I'd be a little more skeptical. But we've had almost what five years now of uh, you know night modes and right. you know deep fusion and that kind of stuff. So this is certainly uh, uh, I, I imagine this will acquit itself. Decently, I'm not saying it's going to perform miracles, but uh, I, I'm not. I'm maybe not a little less skeptical. Yeah, and I'm. I'm just going to say this in the simplest terms possible. They rearranged their photo stack for their processing, so it's it's being processed by different digital filters at different you know at different points mm-hmm. in the the photo chain, the digital pro- imaging chain. Um, I don't know how much of that is going to affect the image quality, but it's good to at least see them trying to give me lip service that they're improving their process. So for, for sure. Uh, well, if you need a little more explanation on the big tech topics like Wi-Fi six, 5g and more, you should check out our related show. Know a little more to know a little more about all that and more at know a little more.com. 
All right, Rich, tell us what's going on with the storage, since that's such a contentious thing in the phone world. At, uh, yes, yes, Raw. we're we're limiting we're limiting our ProRes resolutions based on storage, and we're seeing that in the larger camera area as well. And I got to set this up because we saw a, a really weird camera come out, not just in the APS-C world. You know, we talked about the FX30 and mm-hmm. uh, uh, Fuji's uh, X-H2, mm-hmm. but we also saw new high-end big boy cameras, the ones I will never afford. Hasselblad announced its third medium format mirrorless camera, the X2D100C. Catchy name, guys. As the name suggests, it ups the ante on the previous cameras that topped out at a mere 50 megapixels with a new 102 megapixel sensor matching uh, what Fuji does with their GFX. Uh, 100 series. Like you would expect with a giant big sensor, Hasselblad also promises us some giant big dynamic range at over 15 stops with a native ISO between 100 and 12,800. It uses a new phase detect autofocus system that's supposed to be 66% faster. The last one was contrast based, uses five axis IBIS and includes a big 3.6 inch flip up rear display, which is objectively a very big display. It starts at 8,100 $99, and that's before you put a lens on there. Now, at that price, and with no video capabilities, clearly this is an extremely niche product. We probably wouldn't do much of a discussion about it, except for one key spec, which I have not mentioned yet. The X2D100C has a built-in one terabyte SSD in addition to a single CF Express card slot. So you could store over 4,100 megapixel RAW files without ever putting in a card. That's what we like to call in the business cuckoo bananas <laughs> right so, so one terabyte a lot of storage for an iphone let alone a medium format camera seems to be leading though a bit of a trend anthony and i want to get your thoughts on this ssds increasingly becoming common camera storage so we've seen companies speaking of, of cameras i'll never afford leica offering 64 gigabytes of storage on their new m11 obviously a big way from one terabyte but a bit of a trend it's not just internal SSDs, though. Increasingly, we're seeing the utility of offering direct SSD recording. I remember when the Sigma FP came out a few years ago, that was one of its signature features and really stood out to me as being like, oh, that'd be a great way to do a ton of video. Now the Panasonic GH6 is adding support for it in firmware. Previously, SSDs, you could use it in something like an Atomos Ninja, uh, but you'd be really just recording the HDMI out signal. You're not recording directly from the camera. Even cameras without the functionality directly might get it from third parties. We've seen leaked documents show the camera accessory maker Tilta plans to release a half cage enclosure for Sony cameras that includes a 512 M2 SSD that connects over the the camera's CF uh, Express Type A slot and have enough speeds for pretty much all of your recording modes like ProRes and all the uh, weird codecs that they support there. So I don't know if I'm trusting a third party like hacked SSD to record any kind of high-end cinema stuff, but the Hasselblad thing really caught my eye, and I think one terabyte might be the outlier here for an extremely expensive camera, but do you think we're going to see this as a continuing trend? I've also seen a couple other uh, uh, cameras. Uh, there was a – speaking of Leica, there's a, there a French company called Pixie, I think is P-X, P-I-X-I-I, that also does yep. internal storage on their camera up to, I think, 256 uh, gigabytes. So – is this a trend and why now when we've kind of – it used to be you'd get like four gigs of storage or something like that in a point and shoot or, or maybe your high-end Canon power shot. But it's been over a decade since that's been a thing. This reminds me – Rich, go back in time with me. Okay. Let me set the stage. It's 2006. Canon is releasing their HF line of, of video cameras. Ooh. They offer a slot for an SD card. But SD cards at the time are not big enough to record everything that they want to record. So they offer a model with onboard storage. The onboard storage can record all the modes of the camera in full fidelity all the way up to 1080p, 60 frames a second. Whoa, mind blown. Now, the problem with those those hard drives, of course, was battery life. Woo, it, that, was, that was the trade-off. <laughs> but we had reached a point in video cameras where the portable storage solutions couldn't keep up with what the cameras could do. So that was the next option, and it became a premium option. You could 
the high end models had an option for onboard storage. And then we started getting faster flash storage, and that option just completely disappeared. Just poof, gone. And I wonder, as we come back to today, doop, 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 <laughs> if this is the same thing we're seeing now. We have cameras that are being held back by our storage options and solutions. The price of external storage in the form of SD, CF Express, uh, C- uh, Type A, Type B, whatever card you want to use, those are getting really, really high for the big you know, the, the major storage solutions we want, we can double the cards and have it pump and have, you know, the things pumping out to two different cards at a time. But are we reaching a gate where we just can't, we can't get any, any more onto the card. So now we're having to do something internal or is it that storage SSDs in particular are getting cheap enough that we can just slap it in there as a gimmick. I think Part of it, I, I think it's, I think it's your the first one. I, th- I think that's maybe more of the cause of it. But I also think another part of uh, the other the other shoe for this is that the I/O situation from that internal storage is in a much better state now, where you can connect over USB C, you can connect over Thunderbolt three on some of the depending on the camera, and you can get the high end. So you're not going to be, oh, I have a one terabyte storage drive, but it's going over USB two. Right or 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 something in, incredibly slow where it, it's going to be this bottleneck into your workflow when you need to get that off of there. Part of the benefit of using an SD card is you can take that out, pop it in. You can you get your media off of there one way or the other. Maybe the transfer speed to the PC or, or your Mac or whatever like that isn't isn't still the best. But then you can at least have another card in there and you can you know keep moving on with your camera. I do think the I/O situation on that is is a big part of it and. The fact that CF Express is basically to what Sony is doing is basically just like a PCI Express lane, right? You're basically, you're, it's yep. basically an NVMe drive that you're putting into your camera. So I think technically also that there, the architecture is there to very seamlessly, whether you want to call it an SSD, whether you want to call it CF Express, uh, it's much technically easier. You don't have to write uh, like a specific storage controller or install a, a different storage controller if you wanted to offer this. I don't know for the SSD out stuff, like like because what Sigma and, and what uh, the GH6 are doing is it's USB C to a drive. So I don't know. That's not using the CF Express slot. So. I, I don't know if that's going to become like standard considering every camera now is shipping with USB-C. It would be great if that was an option, especially for, hey, I gotta, I'm going to record a, uh, you know, a game or something like that or a sporting event where mm-hmm. I'm gonna, you know I'm going to be there for three, four hours. I'm going to have a ton of video. It'd be nice to just be able to have a cage, throw your drive on top of that, your little Samsung T3 drive or whatever, and just <laughs> fill that thing up the whole, the whole night, right? Yeah, yeah, and it would. And if the option was internal as well, you know, completely yeah. based inside the camera, like how, especially for stills, because that's typically what you and I both shoot are, are stills. Mm-hmm. You're not running around with film video cameras much these days. Um, how how much faster can I get pictures and how much faster can I clear the buffer if I have onboard storage versus the CF Express Type B that my cameras, my, well, my R5 is using? I don't know, but I'd be willing to to look at that and see if that would be something that would help me, especially sp- shooting sports. Um, you know, if you've got an R3 out there and it's shooting 200 frames in a quarter of a second or whatever craziness that is, <laughs> and then it locks you out for nine seconds while it writes the buffer to the card, you know, what can we do with that? Like what, what can, what could Canon do with that? If they had internal storage that didn't have the interface uh, limitations of the CF express type B. Well, I, I, and, it and excites that, me. It makes me think this could be really good. Well, and that does raise an interesting possibility, right? Because then, because we're, we're we're getting to the point, and now now, now I'm going to get into a weird tech tangent here. Because 
uh, Intel for a long time, they've discontinued it now, but was pushing uh, something called Optane, which is basically like, uh, what was it? Storage class memory, right? Which is like, it was kind of in between the speeds of DRAM, which is insanely, insanely fast. And, and is what your, your, um, your camera primarily writes to. That's the buffer of your camera is DRAM. And then your storage, which is your SSD or your SD card or whatever like that. If they could figure out a way to integrate an SSD into your camera that had something that was, you know, storage class memory grade and that Hasselblad, uh, uh, drive is doing like 3000. Uh, megabits per second. I mean, it's like or megabytes per second. It is super fast. It is mm-hmm. is top end. So if you could have something like that, you're absolutely right. You could almost create like a swap file, maybe kind of situation uh, where you could, uh, you know, it maybe not be as fast as the primary buffer, but prevent that really long lockout. Uh, that really sucks when you <laughs> when you when you accidentally realize you're in high burst mode <laughs> and you <laughs> you're totally filling up your buffer. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've all been there. The other thing is, I I this could actually make me want maybe one of those weird extended grips for a camera if you put a, like an ssd integrated right. into there and you just slap that on there it's like oh it's not just batteries it's actually like hey i got a terabyte now i can yeah. i can tote that around that'd be cool I especially, would like if, especially if i could strap my own mdme or m.2 on there and like yeah. you know yeah that, that's that's Wait, wait for that weird tilt a cage. I, I want to know who the person is that's <laughs> trusting. Like they're like, hey, I got my my A seven S three. I have five thousand dollars worth of glass on this. I'm using this for a high end cinema production, and I'm going to use. I'm going to trust Tilta. Has got my back on this. Yeah, no, yeah. Three D print a cage for yourself at that point. <laughs> All right. If yeah, actually, if uh, if you're like Rich and you're uh, deep into the world of instant film. Film being the keyword there, you might be familiar with Mint Camera. They've been making new cameras for Fujifilm's Instax Film for a while, offering TLR that shoots Instax Mini and range finders for the wide and square films. Now the company announced it's working on a premium compact 35 millimeter film camera, t- camera prototype, which hopes it will be which it hopes will be ready in about six months. They're hoping to keep it priced relatively lower than what premium compacts go for on the used market. Good luck on that. <laughs> uh, for example, contacts point and shoots can go for over $2,000. It's shared a few sample images, and some of them show a resemblance to the classic Role A 35 camera, but it's too early to say much more. And Rich, I know you have a quick thought on this one. I do. There have been a number of like crowdsourced attempts to do 35 millimeter, like new 35 millimeter cameras. Mm-hmm. And the problem is like the reason Mint's able to do instant cameras really well, instant cameras are big. The film is big. So you don't need like quite as fine manufacturing for a lot of parts. You can get away with a lot of bigger things, makes it easier to manufacture. The, the miniaturization, the, like the whole industry that made 35 millimeter cameras possible basically doesn't exist anymore. So it's not something you can just 3D print. It's not, you know, you, you have to invest a lot in some very, very fine parts for this. Now, Mint has a history of doing this. Um, we can, if you want to know who to blame for the rise of super expensive context cameras, uh, thank you, the Kardashians. They've made it a fashion accessory. Uh, and also, these cameras have tons of electronics, so they brick all the time. Uh, like the, you're like two seconds away from those cameras breaking all the time. Beautiful cameras, beautiful lenses. I have a Roly 35. It's my second favorite camera of all time. It's a beautiful, like little timepiece German piece of engineering. Mm-hmm. So if they can if rip off Roly, please, please rip them off. Make this beautiful little camera, and you could probably charge high hundreds. Sub, I think it has to be sub thousand for it to take off on the market. But anywhere from six to eight hundred people would pay for it uh, if it had a decent <laughs> if it had a decent lens. This is all to say if it has a decent lens, right? You know, yeah. all of these all these cameras I'm talking about the Roly, the Contact stuff. They all have Zeiss glass, T Star glass. I have no idea if they can talk to Zeiss about making that. Probably not. Uh, but if you get a good lens on there, uh, price is right. There's a there's definitely a market for it, so I am excited for that. There's a whole lot of EF glass out there, really, really good yeah. glass <laughs> on on, there, so, on a standard that so you there, might be able to get away with. There, there is a company called uh, I think we've talked about it on the show called uh, Omar Lenses that basically mm-hmm. takes old point and shoot cameras, old basically rehouses lenses on like an industrial scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, so hey, talk to Omar. Maybe you can get some cool uh, vintage stuff. You can throw in your uh, weird Roly ripoff camera mints. Get on it. <laughs> Uh, and, of course, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what photo news stories we missed or tell us what you think of this new format. 
feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com with the subject Photo News Monthly. Remember to catch Daily Tech News Show. It's live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll see you next month. This podcast is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>